Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Monday, March 4th, 2024 Public Safety Committee work session. Today we have three topics. The first is the 2023 Emergency Operation Plan. The second is the CIP for the police. And the third is the CIP for Corrections and Rehabilitation. As we begin, I'd like to thank um, Ms. Cummings and her able assistant, Mr. Howard, for, for doing the first packet, and Susan Farag for doing this, the second and third. Uh, as always, they prepare a, a terrific informative packet for us. And unless the committee has anything to, to add to this, I'm going to ask the two people on the panel to please introduce themselves, and then we're going to turn it over to, I guess, Ms. Cummings to, to, uh, to lead us through. Good morning. Uh, I'm Luke Hodgson. I'm the director of the Office of Emergency Management and Homeland Security. Patrick Fleming from the Office of Emergency Management and Homeland Security. Thank you. Ms. Cummings, please. Good morning, council members. My name is Kristen Cummings. I'm a postgraduate fellow with Central Staff, joined by Craig Howard from Central Staff. And we are here today to introduce the 2023 revision of the Emergency Operation Plan, or EOP. The EOP is a multidisciplinary, all-hazards plan that establishes a single comprehensive framework for the management of major emergencies and disasters affecting the county. This plan establishes the roles and responsibilities of various departments during Montgomery County emergency operations and serves as a high-level overview of how our county departments and other relevant entities will respond to various emergency scenarios. The EOP fulfills the Maryland Code requirement that each political subdivision develop and maintain a plan for disaster preparedness. Uh, during this work session today, uh, we would like to highlight just a couple of changes and updates to the revision um, and just some high level a high-level overview of some of the updates. Um, some of the updates are in response to lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. So in this new version, um, there is some highlighted information on um, how the Emergency Operations Center now has the capacity, capacity to operate virtually, hybrid, or in-person, dependent on which um, is most appropriate for the situation at hand. Um, the second major change in this revision is just reorganization. The emergency operations plan has been changed from two sections um, to now have one base plan with 17 um, emergency support function annexes. Um, much of the formatting changes uh, were in response to make it more in line with, um, with uh, FEMA. And um, there are some new sections and sub subsections that either um, go into a little more detail about some of the operations that were already happening or consolidate some of the information that was just found throughout the packet previously. And the third change is that there have been some changes in the emergency support function agencies and um, community partners just highlight some of the bigger ones. The Department of General Services is designated as the sole primary agency for ES ESF number 12 energy. And the Department of Permitting Services is now listed as the sole primary agency on ESF number 17 damage assessment in this new revision. Um, both of these, this change was made because both of these departments now have the staff and tactical means to respond to an emergency res event. Um, also to note, ESF number three has now been renamed Debris Management, Stormwater Management, Dams, and Levees, as dams emergency operations have been transferred from ESF number five emergency management, and all roles and responsibilities have been updated accordingly. Um, and with that, I would like to um, turn the presentation over to um, Director Luke Hodgson. Hodgson and Patrick Fleming from the Office of Emergency Management and Homeland Security. They have a couple slides um, just to show a little more information about the EOP and the process of making this revision. Thank you. You did a very good job. I know this was your first time, but you did a very good. You couldn't tell that if I didn't know that. Go ahead, please. Yeah, she's been great throughout this entire process. So, so thank you so much, Kristen. So. Um, I'm excited to, to introduce the, the new revised uh, emergency operations plan. You'll see some 
um, discrepancies between 2023 and 2024. Um, that's because we submitted it in 2023, but just the, the timetable takes a little while, so we're talking 2024 at this point. Um, as uh, Chris mentioned, the, the revised version includes a number of lessons learned through a number of real-world incidents, exercises, and uh, I think probably most significantly COVID. Yeah. Um, and I, I have here with me Mr. Fleming, who introduced himself. He's a senior policy analyst and regional preparedness specialist. And he had the lion's share of work by leading up the rewrite of the plan. So he can get into some of the more granular details as we get into that discussion. Um, but I want to thank him for his leadership throughout this process. <clears throat> so what is the EOP and what is the EOP, or what isn't the EOP, I guess? Um, as just a recap here, is, is the EOP is really, while we call it a plan, it is more of a framework. And it explains the who and the what of our emergency operations and our recovery within this county. Um, it doesn't explain the how, because the how comes at the department level, again, those more granular plans um, that are in the emergency support functions. Uh, this assigns roles and responsibilities to departments, offices, municipalities, and all of our community partners. So we can't forget um, the whole of community approach here, that it's not just about the government here and all of our partners are included in um, our EOP. Um, this organizes our county departments and offices as well as those community partners into 17 distinct emergency support functions. Um, that facilitates the planning, the coordination, and the execution of uh, the emergency operations plan. And again, this is a whole of government, whole of community approach. Um, so we get input from each department, um, each one of our community partners, and the purpose is to drive a collaborative response to emergencies that advances all of our interests. Not sure what that noise is. It sound like we should buckle up on it. I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Either that or Metro was closer than we wanted them to be. As we talk about emergency preparedness. Yeah, that's right. Oh, brother, yes. Well, so our, uh, our planning process is, uh, we recognize that while OEMHS is responsible for the development and the implementation um, and kind of coaching agencies through the execution of the emergency operations plan. In reality, with this whole community response, it requires everyone's collaboration, and that includes starting at the planning process. So this revision process has been very deliberate, it's been very methodical, and we've taken our time to do so, so that we've been able to engage every one of our partners, whether inside or outside the government. Uh, this included our municipal partners, who have been very, very active um, in this, uh, very responsive, and that's not unusual, but it's important to note that they are key players in how we respond to these events. Um, how we approached this was multiple surveys to get this started, and these went to each of the primary supporting and cooperating agencies that support those 17 emergency support functions. Individual meetings were held with each of the emergency support functions and all of the agencies that supported it, and that was to kind of walk through scenarios and how this would actually play out so that we could fine tune the language to reflect actual operations. Um, and then over many months, we've incorporated numerous rounds of feedback. We've produced numerous drafts. They've gone out to a great deal of stakeholders, and we've taken all that feedback, and um, that has been Patrick's joy over the past several months to sort through all that and incorporate that back into a, a comprehensive, sensible document, and that's what he's done here. So once the department directors um, all approved of it, it went to our CAO and the county executive. They've approved it, um, and now we're moving to that final step, which is the council review and ratification of it, um, and that's where we're here today. So since we're here speaking with the council, I think it's important to point out what council's role is uh, in the EOP. And most of you know this because it's in code, but this is also just reflected in our emergency operations plan. So in the spirit of whole community, council plays a critical role in our response and recovery to these emergencies. So in general, council creates and establishes broad policy and regulations. You guys appropriate resources that we can use for emergencies. But in general, just like most of the things that happen in the government, you allow the execution to move over to the executive branch. However, during an emergency, council plays several critical roles, um, and that's mentioned throughout the EOP. If you want to look at the specifics, you want kind of a summary, if you go to page 23 on the EOP, that lists in a condensed version everything that the council is responsible for. 
but just at a high level, these roles include approving the extension of a state of emergency uh, beyond the original three-day uh, declaration that's made by the county executive if we find that necessary, uh, appropriating funds either in advance of or in the middle of through uh, supplemental uh, funds for the emergency response and recovery, internally maintaining a, con a continuity of operations plan to ensure that the council can continue to maintain its critical functions throughout an emergency and during the recovery period. Um, providing emergency related information to your constituents is always critical that um, those of you who have had emergencies happen in your districts, um, you know that you guys are some of the first that I call because you do have that, uh, that trusted relationship within your community and we leverage that to the extent possible. And then you designate a council member who serves as the council's emergency liaison, which is relatively new in, in uh, the last several years. Uh, that is a critical role that serves to coordinate between the executive branch and the legislative branch as a single point of contact so that we maintain that communication and coordination throughout the event. So getting into some of the updates, um, besides what was mentioned earlier about the revisions to the ESFs, um, there are these 17 distinct emergency support function annexes, and we commonly refer to those as ESFs. So an ESF, uh, just to kind of condense it down, is a functional area of response or recovery. And a good example, some of those you can see there if you can read them, transportation and communication technology are just a couple examples. And what that does, we build a primary agency who oversees the entire execution of that particular ESF in the response and recovery phase. Um, and then we allocate additional resources primarily through county agencies and non-governmental agencies that support that emergency support function. So all of those fall under an umbrella of an emergency support function. Um, so besides the revisions to the nomenclature of ESF-3, um, we've stepped away from being co-primary agencies uh, for ESF-12, energy, and ESF-17, which is damage assessment. Of course, we're there to help all of our ESFs, but we only have so much bandwidth so those agencies taking that on is, is greatly appreciated by us. Um, we also have to reorganize some of the EOP to match up with our FEMA Comprehensive Preparedness Guidance that was recently released. And those are the high-level changes we can get into more if, if, if you'd like to um, during the discussion period. So OEMHS approaches all of our work around the EOP. We figure that the more we practice this, the more we're familiar with it, the easier it is to activate it when it comes time. So we always consider ourselves at some state of activation. Um, where we are in the activation depends on the size and severity of the incident and really how many ESFs it will take to come to bear to bring about a resolution, uh, both in the emergency phases and the recovery phases of that emergency. Um, looking at those four activation levels, um, our normal operations is how we typically operate. Um, obviously, the word normal there would indicate that. Um, OMHS monitors uh, conditions at all times, and we do that through a number of, of avenues. Um, and we make changes. We work with our partners. We make community notifications. We make adjustments to our posture. And examples of that include relatively simple things like road closures, residential fires, and gas leaks. Um, once we're notified of an incident, that uh, requires some situational awareness or at least some light coordinating among some of our key emergency support functions, we elevate that to enhanced monitoring. So as you can see, the change there is that we now have more ESFs coming in to our EOC, either virtual or in person. Um, examples of that include um, our recent flooding um, and storm events in the county. So some of our, our deluges of rain that we've gotten, we've gone to an enhanced monitoring phase. Um, and if the incident or the special event poses an imminent risk uh, to the community, we're prepared regardless of how many ESFs we think we may eventually need. So we'll move up to a partial activation at that point, and that's where you have four or more ESFs that come to bear. And finally, that highest level is full activation, and that's all of our ESFs. All 17 are activated, um, and that's when we require extensive uh, coordination response and, uh, and collaboration for the activities for the response and, and the uh, recovery. Examples of that are relatively rare. Um, the two that come to mind are the blizzard of 2016, 
Uh, so you can see how long since we've had a kind of a weather event that called for that. But of course, COVID-19 also called for a full activation and a full activation that lasted uh, almost interminably. <laughs> Uh, one of the changes we've made, and uh, we, we talked about this a little bit at the beginning, was uh, updating our EOC organizational chart. So we've made some changes to reflect how we actually operate, because what we were looking at was we had this uh, uh, kind of framework that didn't match up how we could practically implement emergency operations. So this was especially important for the interaction between what goes on on the scene and what happens with our emergency operations center, be it virtually or in the the actual physical emergency operations center. All of this is consistent with the National Incident Management System. Um, one of our, I'd say on several of our recent events, what we've realized is that the disaster manager needs to be either on scene uh, with our incident command post, uh, needs to be with our elected officials, or needs to be with some of our senior appointed officials um, to come up with a more of a strategic approach to what goes on. So what we've done is we've designated an EOC manager um, and that EOC manager can assume management of the EOC at any time the disaster manager is otherwise occupied. This is important because it allows the disaster manager to maintain a much higher level of situational awareness and not get lost, you know, lose, lose the forest for the trees, so to speak, um, when we're managing the technicalities of the emergency operations center. But it still assigns a person who maintains uh, the very methodical approaches that we do use in the emergency operations center. Um, we've updated the county organizational chart for emergency response, and uh, the big change you'll see there is we used to have the logistics and finance section, and through COVID, we realized just how much of a draw logistics can be. So we have separated out um, to match what mon many of our federal partners use. So now we have a logistics section and a separate finance and administration section. Um, we now display those sections in a horizontal line where they're all evenly across that horizontal line, and those sections are planning, logistics, operations, and administration, uh, and finance. And then we've also added coordinating lines. As you can see, the ESFs there are at the bottom. They're the most important, but they're, they sit at the bottom of that organizational chart, that they coordinate directly with those individual sections rather than going up directly to the disaster manager, the incident commander, or whoever else may be uh, farther up there. Um, and this builds, I, th I think one thing that's important here is that what we took into account here is building a framework where we could easily incorporate external um, incident management teams and other resources that we may bring in to uh, augment what we have. And that may be because we have a particularly long duration event and our staff simply can't endure th that event or we simply uh, have our resources are, are uh, outnumbered, and we need to bring in some extra help either from the state or the national capital region, which isn't uncommon, but this allows us to very easily and seamlessly mix them in there without redoing the entire organizational structure once that team arrives. So if you could see in there the, the uniforms and the name tags that are there, um, you would see what what emergency management is really all about for me, and that's getting all of these folks together in a room from all of these different disciplines, from all these different communities, um, from all of these different uh, equities that we represent that look at the whole community, and that's how emergency management really happens. We coalesce these relationships and we maintain this constant and candid dialogue where we look at what we're doing and what we can do better to serve our community. And that feeds into what is our continuous improvement process. Um, and this is sort of how that goes. Uh, the EOP establishes the roles and responsibilities and the expectations. Um, once the EOP is adopted, those ESF agencies will go back and they will either fine tune or develop new plans, um, like I said, at the more granular level to uh, execute their, their specific mission areas in the ESFs. Um, then our entire emergency response community, which involves everyone in the government, everyone um, and the community who's involved in any one of these emergency responses comes together to do group training on the emergency operations plan. We then do a number of exercises at different levels and different uh, approaches to those exercises. And with that, along with our after action reports from our real world incidents, we take this feedback loop and we get that moving through these kinds of discussions through after action reports. Um, those after action reports 
absolutely are incorporated into a next version of either our, our emergency operations plan or our policies and procedures. Um, it doesn't wait for the four years for our emergency operations plan to be updated. Those are um, immediately implemented so that we can more effectively meet the community's needs for the next emergency. And what you're seeing today, this revised framework um, that's a more accurate representation of what we do and how we do it, um, and how we can leverage all of the resources that are available to us, um, both governmentally and non-governmentally, uh, this is the outcome of our improvement process. So this is, um, while we call it an improvement process, this is really more of our uh, philosophical approach to emergency management, that, that this is a cycle that we are constantly involved in. And with that, um, I present to you what is the 2023-2024 Montgomery County Emergency Operations Plan draft for your consideration, and I yield to the committee for any questions and discussion that uh, Mr. Fleming and I can handle. So thank you for your time. Thank you, and thank you for doing such a good job. You know, I, um, candidly, you and your department, and it's not just when you got there, it was prior to you being there as well, certainly you've carried it forward. but. The public actually takes you for granted. That's how good you are. Uh, and nobody should, but it's comforting to know that you're that good. Um, and and you, you mentioned that um, uh, communication, obviously. Is, and I applaud the, the continuing partnership with the municipalities. I mean, they are a large segment of Montgomery County. In many cases, they do a lot of the work that the county would be doing in those areas, and and we need to make sure that they're a part of our of our system. Um, but I do I, I did want to mention that that and I like to remind our government that we have to be careful when we're calling things by their initials, mm -hmm. you know, uh, ESF, and and you get used to it. I mean, it becomes part of your dialogue. But the public has no idea what ESF is. And then we go on with EOP. We start the, and so as often as possible when we're discussing it, if you could every now and then throw in and explain to the, to the public what it is, your staff has, has recommended that we approve this with, as submitted by the executive. And I certainly am good there. Uh, so I'm for that. And if my, uh, committee members, have anything to add, please? I have some questions. Please. Uh, all right. I will do my best to adhere to your direction about not using acronyms. It is very, very hard in this context not to use acronyms. Um, so the, the, the beginning phase of what we were provided, in, including your emergency operation plan, the new one, um, included the resolution that was dated February 13th, 2018, and then adopted in March of 2018. Uh, were annual reviews of the emergency operations plan conducted and updates made between 2018 and the version we've received now? Yeah, and, and, and Patrick, who predates me, can explain this a little bit more, but um, for our emergency uh, management accreditation program, we're required to uh, review our plans at a certain uh, cadence. Um, for the emergency operations plan, that's two year. Every two years, we look at the plan, and we look to see it. So it's more of an informal look. It doesn't go through the full um, you know, ratification process that we're going through today. Every four years, it goes through a full potential rewrite. I mean, this is where we go through the the months, months, you know, sometimes it stretches more than a year um, rewrite process. Um, candidly, we missed the mark during COVID. Uh, we simply just didn't have the resources, nor did any of the other agencies. Right. Um, and what we realized is that should we change the direction in the middle of COVID when we're just getting used to this, uh, this methodology, um, it would be to the detriment of everybody. So. Um, just like so many other emergency management agencies out there, we miss that. Um, that said, it still went through its every two-year review, mm -hmm. um, and there's authority in there for uh, the, the director of OEMHS to make minor revisions um, at my discretion um, with the approval of, of the executive. 
there were some minor changes made. It was mostly nomenclature because we had agencies change names and things of that nature. It was nothing that operationally changed. So that's to assure you that we are constantly looking at it and that we are maintaining that cadence, but also to be transparent with you that during COVID, we were thrown off the rails. Right. Um, and then there's an update in this one that refers to the inclusion of prevention as yeah. one of the categories that needs to be addressed. Um, and I noted that the summary or discussion of what prevention is only had two sentences, and one of them talked about preparedness, which was, in fact, another category. So, um, and prevention, in, in my view of this, in the greater landscape of emergency management, is really prevention of human-related conduct. Mitigation is for things where you're able to, for like environmental, for example, right? Um, so what are the recommendations moving forward for dealing with prevention in a more th thorough and holistic fashion? So I'm going to defer to Patrick on this to start, and then I'll, I'll tell you what, what my thoughts are. Yeah, the inclusion was to up because it's part of an update for the um, – so I don't use the acronym, the um, <laughs> Comprehensive Preparedness Guide, which was updated right before we started the plan, was to include the um, preparedness and um, prevention, or, prevention and mitigation to like clearly, more clearly delineate that. And so, yes, it is to be there to, that's why we specifically called it out in here. And, um, you know, it, it's going to be as we go forward, we'll have to really look at what that's going to be for our office or I think so I'll defer to, yep. to Luke but that's why it was included yeah so so that led to the inclusion of it I think the brevity that you see there is representative of the fact that we view this as something that's used during emergencies and as we recover from emergencies which is obviously far after prevention and mitigation in reality, the lion's share of the time that we spend in emergency management is doing prevention and mitigation. And preparedness. And prepare. Right. Absolutely. Yes. Right. Yes. All of the things that we do prior to an emergency right. to yes. minimize the impacts of that um, or avoid them entirely. Um, but I think we, we need to be careful that the emergency operations plan doesn't become an emergency management plan that includes all aspects, mm -hmm. facets of emergency management, sure. and thereby dilutes what we're actually concentrating on, which is just response and to some extent recovery. Um, so rest assured that, that prevention, preparedness, uh, mitigation are where we spend the vast majority of our time. Um, but I don't think you're going to see that reflected in an emergency operations plan. I just, um, for me, that's kind of, that's not a great thing. Right, um, and, and, and I'm saying that with, with my own background in mind because truthfully, if you've done a good job on the prevention side, then you don't have to get to the recovery side. You might have to get to response, but you're able to respond and prevent before it gets to catastrophe, right? So I, I appreciate what you're saying about the distinction in this being a not all-inclusive thing, but there is there's a reason why FEMA has elevated that category, and I do think that that's important for us to get better eyes on and to be able to delineate, as you've said, between it being full emergency management planning and the emergency operations plan. Um, but we just had an incident of swatting at the State House on Thursday night, for example, right? And no doubt the after action response and discussion of how that unfolded and what the, you know, what worked, what didn't, you know, all the after actions are happening now. But we also have to think a little bit stronger about what we're doing to prevent that from getting out of hand. So um, that would be my ask for future reviews. And then you did talk about, um, you talked about uh, mitigation planning and um, the different things that we've been doing to, to get there and, and what falls in that bucket. And I noticed and I don't remember what ESF stands for, so I apologize. But their emergency support function, function. Yeah. it was the F I was stuck on. Okay, yeah. emergency support function 12 is energy. Emergency support function 3 is stormwater. I noticed there's not one that's specific to public utilities, and yet public utilities play an integral role in this, whether you're talking about WSSC and our 
water and sewer management, or whether you're talking about our electricity providers, and they have certain obligations for uh, preventive maintenance, if you will, on trees and things that are on their easements and rights of way. So um, could you talk a little bit about how this interplays with our public utilities? So this is a, this is a good example of an emergency support function. So the function would be, um, let's use energy as an example, and we'll use a, an electrical uh, public utility. Um, so uh, our, we assign a county agency that we have uh, some autonomy over, and I say we meaning that the government has some mm -hmm. autonomy mm -hmm. over, to oversee the fact that we are going to execute emergency response and recovery for our community, whatever that emergency may be. Um, it's important that we have that, that control and we have somebody within our own house that's overseeing that. Mm -hmm. That's the primary agency. The cooperating and the partner agencies all contribute to it, maybe as much as or even more so, depending on what the emergency is, as the primary agency. So in that energy uh, emergency support function, you have a number of uh, cooperating and, uh, what do we call them, cooperating? Co cooperating and support. Support yeah. uh, agencies. And there you would have PEPCO, BG&E, all of our public utilities that work closely, but it is the responsibility of the ESF primary agency, which in this case is the Department of General Services, to oversee them, to do that coordination with them, to ensure that they have their plans that are in collaboration and they're in sync with all the other entities that go into that emergency support function. And then they report on behalf of all of those agencies that fall under the emergency support function they report up into the emergency management structure of the emergency operations center or whatever structure we have set up at that time. So for the executive branch agencies that are tasked with that niche area of responsibility, in addition to under actual emergency conditions, are they responsible for reporting up to you about oversight and compliance with the mitigation efforts that they would fall in their bucket. Yes. So that's, again, so this goes back to our philosophy that we are we base everything sort of on the, the EOP mm -hmm. so that um, everyone is always prepared for it. And, and we live in a world, in the emergency management world, where um, we're far more familiar with the emergency operations plan than, than most agencies are. Um, but we need them to be prepared when we do get to that situation to function in a different paradigm than they normally do. So that's where our planning, our training, our exercise comes in, primarily planning. So we work with them to develop their emergency support function specific plans um, that are at that, again, more granular detail, and there's a number of plans that fall under each emergency mm -hmm. support function. Mm -hmm. And we facilitate that collaboration and that coordination and communication between all of the entities that are in the emergency support function to build that comprehensive plan that will allow us to fulfill that mission. Okay. So that is one of our primary duties in our office is to support all of that coalition building and the group planning that goes on. And then my last question. Um, I know you called out and noted, and I got to not use the acronym, that every, um, every executive branch agency is required to have a continuity, continuity of operations plan. Absolutely. Um, are they also required to have an active assailant plan, response plan? Um, they are through their uh, facility emergency action plan. Um, that one is a more all hazards approach, but we put an extra emphasis on um, active assailant situations when we do that training and their planning, mm -hmm. um, and we exercise with them. Just because of the prevalence of that, we've elevated that, that it's not just fire drills at this point. Right. It's, it's very specific scenarios where you would need to respond differently. So through, not through the continuity of operations planning, right. but through the facility emergency action planning program that we maintain in the Office of Emergency Management, every agency is required to have that plan, and that plan includes an active assailant uh, component to it. And do, does your office review those and co yes. provide comments and feedback? We, we review them twice a year. Um, they receive um, an objective numerical grade that's uh, given back to their uh, facility emergency uh, uh, action planning coordinator. I want to make sure I didn't say <laughs> FEEP because I would have I would have said FEEP right council there. member. You're, You're doing right very good. You really um, are. Okay. So that's communicated back to that particular person as well as the director. Mm -hmm. um, and 
typically we work on any deficiencies through the planning process, but there are times when we have turnover or whatever and we need to flag that, and then we engage more heavily to make sure that they are prepared for that. So, yes, we are the oversight body that, for lack of a better term, grades that and makes sure that it's compliant with the standards that are set up through those programs, so through the code continuity of operations and through our facility emergency action planning. Um, those are just two of the examples of the programs that we have, that we have objective criteria, we have guidance, we have staff members who are assigned to liaise with each one of the agencies, coach them through that because we want them to be successful, mm -hmm. but then also give them objective scoring so that they can work on particular areas where they may see some deficiencies. Great. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I do you all have anything else, Mr. Cummings or Mr. Howard? No? I think we're in, I believe we're in agreement that this is going to be accepted as as the uh, uh, county executive has, has uh, suggested. Mm -hmm. So do you need an actual vote or are we good? We're good? Okay. Thank you all very much for what you do. Thank you. Absolutely. We all smiled enough in Craig's direction. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I don't know that he can always tell that, though. I mean, <laughs> tough crowd. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you this morning. Good to see you. Thanks. Um, next, we're going to hear from Ms. Farag for the next two topics, and the first one is the CIP from the police, and I believe uh, we have a few folks from the police as well as Mr. Dice, and I don't know if Mr. Assant is coming to, Mr. Assant is in the backup, uh, backup, uh, yeah, second string quarterback. Yeah, he literally has your back at this point, literally. Okay, so if the panel would please identify yourselves, and then we're going to turn it over to Ms. Farag to lead us through. Please. Michael Ma, West Police uh, Facility Management. Uh, good morning, Derek Kerrigan, Office of Management and Budget. David Dice, Director, Department of General Services. Good morning, Darren Frank, Assistant Chief, Montgomery County Police. Very good. Unless the committee has anything, we're going to turn it to Ms. Farag to lead us through, please. Good morning, everyone. Um, this The police department has three projects in its CIP this year for total cost in the six-year expenditure schedule of about $31 million. That's a decrease of almost $18 million over last approved CIP, which was $49 million. The change is primarily due to the substantial completion of the 6th District Station, which should be complete in FY26. And that is your first project to take a look at on pages 1 and 2. This project was actually first introduced in the CIP back in FY01. And at that time, design was programmed to begin in FY06. It had various delays over the years, including um, significant delay during the Great Recession, um, for FY1924, the CIP, it was provided for the planning, design, and construction of a new 28,000-square-foot 28, 28, station, as well as about 60,000 square feet of parking garage. Um, it actually has. You went to the groundbreaking last June, and construction is in progress. The current timeline estimates that construction will finish in FY26. Project costs are remaining the same at about $38 million. The station is expected to be completed in 2025. Recommending approval as submitted by the executive. You want to do each project as we go? I, you know, I get to see that uh, as I drive home every every evening. It is amazing to me that it's you. You don't always see people working, and at the next day, it's like elves came and you know the thing is all <laughs> is is uh, progressing. Yeah. So it does seem that it's it's on the right time frame, and it does seem that and. Mr. Sant is in the in the uh, audience today, but uh, way back when has it been 20 years, uh, Greg, that that the city of Gaithersburg proudly got the land, and uh, I guess it's been 20 years, and so we're finally very very pleased to see that it's getting to where it is. Anybody else on this topic? Yeah. Project's about 35 percent complete. We're up out of the ground. One of the things that. Councilmember Katz just pointed out is we see we hear this a lot. People say, "Well, where's this going?" Because the most important stuff is the stuff you don't see. Yeah. Uh, and and once the footers are in and the concrete's poured, and of course there's a 
a large garage that's a component to this. So once that's done, and that, that's when you see poof. So yeah. we're out of the ground. Steel framing's begun, 35%, and we're right on schedule. Good. Great. Very good. Glad that that's progressing. And with that, I think everybody's good. So I always say we should take yes as an answer. Go yes. ahead, please, Susan. The second project is the Public Safety Communication Center Phase 2, and this is electrical distribution and HVAC upgrade, heating, ventilation, air conditioning upgrade. Um, this is a the PSCC is a two-story office building built in 81. It had some major renovations completed in 2003 and an additional renovation in 2013 and 2016. We originally leased this space but purchased it in 2019 and that was a separate standalone project that provided both for the purchase of the building as well as the replacement of um, mission critical HVAC systems. Some of you may recall that there was an um, HVAC system failure at the alternate ECC. So these are extremely critical systems, both for um, just climate control for the people working there, but also for all of the systems that they're dealing with. The remaining um, building HVAC systems are either original or, or more than 20 years old at this point. And this project is providing for the second phase of building system improvements, including generator plan replacement, redundant electrical distribution upgrade, condenser water distribution, rooftop units, and HVAC system heat pumps. Um, the total project costs are about $21 million. That reflects a small increase uh, due to cost escalation. Design ban began in March 2022, and construction is scheduled to be completed by October of this year. Also recommending approval as submitted by the executive on this project. Here again, I'm good with it. I, I uh, went to the uh, post office this morning and saw the, the facility. It seems like there's always uh, a, a dumpster there or something. It's a constant work, but obviously that this is necessary that, that we have the, the, uh, the proper uh, HVAC system and whatnot, not only for the, the comfort of the people working in those buildings, but also for the, for the, uh, the, the work that the uh, computers, et cetera, do. So. Yeah, if you've ever been there during an emergency when it's a hubbub of activity, it's, it was always been an uncomfortable building. This is the challenge that we always encounter when we buy an office building and retrofit it for something it wasn't originally intended for. So that's what we've been about under phase one, which was just basically for the office comfort. Phase two will be the major components. Uh, contract, we're waiting on a purchase order out of the procurement office. Proposals have been received and awards recommended. Uh, so right now the work is uh, zero complete because we're just getting started. And it'll involve both a major overhaul of an electrical upgrades to the entire facility as well as uh, roof and mechanical equipment replacements. So as soon as we get the green light to go, we're ready to hit the ground and we're on target for, with that, a uh, substantial completion uh, about late summer of next year. Go ahead, please. Um, you, know, you noted roof equipment type things. And I'm just one, I mean, I know that was customary and has always been sort of a customary thing. And yet, as we are in more wild weather times and more fluctuating extreme temperatures, um, is that still the standard for where to place that type of equipment? Well, uh, it, it, it is, again, when you're not doing a purpose-built structure. Right. So there's right. limited real estate on the site, and uh, we've looked at all that. It's still, in, in our view, for this building, it's the right place to put it. It would require substantial changes to the building and the site to put it elsewhere. Are there things that can be done when this work takes place to help um, mitigate that, like leaving it on the roof, mm -hmm. right, but um, additional protective measures to help with the longevity or functionality? Well, the, the, the equipment itself, uh, again, this is an old building, mm -hmm. and the equipment itself uh, has functioned. It's certainly on the downward side of its right. operating curve, right. uh, and the real trick is to keep this equipment current and maintained. Uh, as opposed to, as you recall, during our lean years, we were in a break-fix mode, right. which is not an optimal way to operate and certainly maintain equipment. Especially we do for this operation. Right. And, and uh, as Ms. Farg pointed out, we had a problem uh, with the uh, alternate ECC right. when a rooftop unit actually froze and shut down the 911 system. 
uh, which we are painfully uh, acutely aware of and have vowed to never allow happen again. This is my other plug for uh, uh, in our operating budget. We are we are about ready this summer, late spring, early summer, to um, initiate our, our uh, asset management system, which will allow us to track maintenance, age, and condition of equipment and replace it before it goes out of service. I'd like to get not just preventive but predictive maintenance so that we are ahead of this equipment, as you said, uh, uh, Councilmember Katz, particularly for our public safety facilities. And there's none more important than the uh, PSCC. So we're very aware of this, and we think that the equipment that we're getting, it's modern equipment, it will have a useful life of 20 years, and we'll track it for that duration. What had happened with the AECC is that we had a rooftop unit that was past its serviceable life and failed. So we don't ever want to be there again. Right. Thank you. Okay. We're good. Please, we'll move on to the... Sure, and the last project for your consideration today, although I've got some updates that are in facility planning, is the Outdoor Firearms Training Center. This is a very old structure and facility. It was brought over last year in an off year as an amendment to delay the project for fiscal capacity. At that time, since it was an off year, the Public Safety Committee decided that it would go into this project in much more depth this year during the full CIP. So I have a lot more detail for you for consideration today. Um, it's, it's an old facility. It's outdated in function as, as well as um, materials and the way it allows people to train. It's very complex, and we really will not be able to get into all the complexities and needs today. So I'm going to point out some of the larger ones for you. Um, the project today, the scope of work makes improvements to the outdoor range, a 2017 program of requirements. Advise that the existing facility must be upgraded to address increased numbers of uses. Um, more people are using it. Uh, changes in firearms technology and new instructional techniques. Uh, the scope of work would include widening the rifle range from 5 to 20 lanes and the pistol range from tw and lengthening the pistol range from 25 yards to 75 yards. It would also install more appropriate targeting equipment at both. Additionally, it would provide an open air pavilion for weapons cleaning and provide new ex and a new explosive bunker. There have been some minor upgrades over the years, and those include primarily security, and that includes perimeter security as well as a new ammunition, ammunition bunker. Um, We've discussed this before, but the outdoor range provides many different types of training and is used by both recruits and officers for in-service training, as well as by specialty training for SWAT. Um, I don't know what that stands for. Don't make me say. Um, CERT, which is the Special Event Response Team, and SAT, Special Assignment Teams, as well as external partner agencies. All the police departments in the county use this. There are national capital region agencies that also use this facility. The site in this project um, offer the opportunity to change the facility to craft dynamic scenario-based training opportunities that would better mimic true high-stress incidents. Um, I've got a list. I've got a history on page five of the CIP. It was originally put in the CIP back in FY07, and it had a larger scope of work, a larger program of requirements at that time. Um, it was challenged by the Great Depression, and it was ultimately removed in FY13 through 18 CIP. That is the time where they did some modest upgrades that I spoke about, uh, mostly security, and they did that with existing appropriation authority. It was then returned to the CIP in FY21-26 with its current scope of work, which is also outlined on page 5 to compare. There are some current operational challenges that I wanted to bring to your attention. Um, and they're listed on pages five and six. I think primarily it's critical that isn't really discussed as much as the safety and the health issues. The program of requirements addresses the need for a safe working environment for both the trainees and the staff who are using the facilities. And you have full-time instructors that are on site um, through all the different classes and all the different uses. There is no separation right now between shooting areas and the classroom building and thus, quote, no refuge from noise, unquote. This interruption makes the learning and working environment difficult, and the program of requirements would relocate the classroom and office space away from the two ranges. 
Additionally, the existing office space has been modified to perform weapons cleaning and munitions storage. The program of requirements would provide for a complete rehab of the existing structure to allow for weapons cleaning in multiple areas, quote, with proper ventilation and washing facilities, along with storage for duty ammunition. There's also a need to expand the restroom facilities on site. Part of this is in the current scope of work, and that includes only building the outdoor ammunitions or the weapons cleaning structure. Another uh, concern is the lack of weather protection. The range has very little weather protection for those using the facility. It's used in all weather conditions, including rain or snow, unless the weather becomes too dangerous. But there are certain weather conditions that can create problems with the ammunition and targets, which may become saturated. There are no shaded areas really in the pistol range for users, and there are only very basic cover in the rifle range. The program of requirements would recommend installing a covered make-ready area in the pistol range with tables along the length of both ranges, approximately where the current 25-yard firing lane exists. A covered area would offer some protection from precipitation and sun, but would not offer any um, temperature control. The outdated equipment we've talked about a lot. The target systems were originals from 1989 and 1992 and they're of limited use today for tactical scenario-based training and shooting due to their size and the lack of separation between the training areas. The targets are steel, and they lack the modern technology that can facilitate training for decision-making and critical thinking skills. Um, there's also insufficient range space for scenario-based training. The rifle range has five lanes, and to meet current user volume and modern training needs, it should have 20. For example, the SWAT team requires practice shooting from vehicles and at longer distances. And further, the rifle range target system is outdated and does not meet current training standards or best practices. The pistol range is 25 yards, and it's not long enough either for modern training techniques. They can, officers can only move laterally when doing any type of um, basic tactical shooting. A longer range would enhance the safety of tactical training and allow for more realistic shooting scenarios. Um, over the years, that project has proposed expansion from 50 to 75 yards. The earthen berms, um, that's been an ongoing concern, and the current project scope would increase and refurbish the berms um, on both sides and at the end of the rifle and pistol ranges. And these dirt berms function as backstops, but they're deteriorating due to erosion and high volume firing on both the ranges. Um, specialized SWAT training, the current program of requirements also calls for a new building structure that would accommodate dynamic scenario-based training by the SWAT team and other officers. This type of truck structure would enable training for simulated building entry and room clearing, and it could accommodate the use of non-lethal simulated ammunition training exercises. Um, this is a best practice that helps mimic the stress experienced in real-life situations such as the Discovery Building hostage situation or the shooting within Magruder High School. The type of structure should have movable partitions so that instructors could vary the layout and create dynamic training scenarios. And ideally, the structure would be covered and have climate control, variable lighting, a sound system, and areas for instructor observation and monitoring. This is in the program of requirements. It's not in the project scope for the current CIP. Um, for recommended changes for this year, the design is scheduled to begin in FY26, and construction is scheduled for completion in FY30. The total project costs are $5.9 million. Site improvements are the primary cost driver at $3.9 million. The project scope would, um, would be I, the, the site improvements and the water stormwater management would be the largest parts of the current cost of the current scope cost. Um, while this is not in the current scope, it is in the current program of requirements. And I think it's important to look at training at this point from multiple perspectives, right? You've got extremely high turnover and you have a short staffing in the police department. I don't really see that easing anytime soon. So it's critical to invest in the training um, at all aspects. And while firearms is not a pleasant subject to think about, this is not really training so much firearms as it is the human point of decision making, you know, in very split second high critical stress um, situations that have life or death consequences. Um, so for that reason, I think it's really important to start really investing across the spectrum in training. This is not meant to take away from other types of training, um, de-escalation training, mental health training, ICAT training, all of those continue and can be, um, you know, increased and stressed as well at different, at the different facilities. 
But I do think that the firearms training and the decision making and the scenario based training are a really critical factor moving forward. Um, at this point, policing has changed so much in 35 years. You know, there's a lot of more complex issues that they have to respond to um, that require, you know, high volume of officers to respond, critical life decision, things that we would never think of. All of the bomb threats that have been occurring in the schools and the synagogues are just require a lot of manpower. And we think that they're all swatting, but you never, you know, but you never know. You never know what they're going to um, encounter. So for that reason, my recommendations on this are twofold. I'm recommending that um, the Public Safety Committee consider accelerating this project, the whole project, the scope of work to, as is presented to you today, which is the outdoor firearms range, by one year and start the planning phase in FY25 on the current scope of work. On-site staff and other users are working in challenging conditions right now that impact operations and to a certain extent it impacts health and safety. I'm also recommending reviewing the site again to see whether or not there are more cost-effective approaches to renovations, such as the further use of the HESCO walls rather than concrete partitions and backstops. Additionally, the range upgrades that provide some weather protection and temperature control would help expand range capacity by expanding time and conditions that recruits and officers can practice. I'm also recommending a re-examination of the addition of a covered climate-controlled structure that would accommodate SWAT and other officer training. Again, it's in the current program of requirements, but it's not in the current project scope. The SWAT team now trains in various structures with permission from private property owners to ensure that its scenario-based training is conducted under varying conditions. If they practice in the same place too long, they just develop the muscle memory for that, and it's not as good as varying conditions under which they train. But relying on the private property is not ideal, and having a county structure that would provide for a more contextual environment that officers can perform in would facilitate more and higher quality training. It would also allow for the more robust simulated event training, which is a best practice. Um, these skills are needed for maintaining site safety and ensuring operational success. This type of structure would benefit SWAT, obviously, but it would also benefit in-service training for all officers. Unlike the rest of range functions, however, this flexible training structure could be located elsewhere, including in leased warehouse space. And this may be something that the executive may also wish to explore to expedite training opportunities now. It takes a long time for any CIP project really to get off the road and completed. Um, if le leased space is pursued, this would be an operating budget issue. So I'm recommending um, expediting the project by one year and also examining whether or not um, this flexible covered training space could be built, either lease space or including it back in the scope of work for this project. Thank you for being so very thorough. I know that you have some thoughts on it as well. I, you know, I, I don't believe that we can be too careful on our training. And, and I think that what for too many years we've said, well, you know, we can wait another year for the the projects that you're that you're suggesting and unfortunately we've waited but the the world hasn't and so uh, though i don't know what we can and can't afford at this point and i, I it, at the very least we don't want it to slip which is what we've done for many years i'm sorry i didn't mean to interrupt um there may yes you did go ahead <laughs> <laughs> but um <laughs> there may be ways to provide appropriate funding for this, and that's something that I can develop with other council staff as we move forward through the CIP process. Um, so if you look at it more on the merits of the changes, um, that would be helpful, and we can always bring it back before the Public Safety Committee. And I'm glad you interrupted. I was being flippant, and I shouldn't have been, but, I, but it won't stop me from the next time. Um, but having said that, I think your interruption was absolutely, literally, I don't want to say on target because of this topic, but, but it literally, thank you for the head shake. Um, but we need to make certain that we are doing this and that our, that our training is, is up to, to par. Um, so I do think that that would be uh, the way to go forward for this. And then the question is, for us to lease space, is that even a possibility? I mean, I don't know who wants to lease space for this. It's, it, it, it is, yes, if it's a possibility. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I do know uh, that leasing is not an overnight thing, and it would have to be for a period of time that's extensive. 
and would be conditioned upon finding a property owner who's willing to use it for the purposes outlined here. Uh, those are all challenging it, elements, and least. I'm not sanguine on on its of its taking place. It's it's a fairly common solution that people we I, people come to me all the time and say, well, can we just lease space? I go, well, technically yes, practically, I don't know. Yeah. So, um, and it's certainly not the optimal long-term solution. But any lease we do would be at a minimum five and possibly ten years in order to make it ink properly and deal with a property owner who's willing to lose that uh, site for that purpose for those many years in conjunction with having any neighbors who are comfortable with that usage. Which is also going to cause a, a little bit of discussion, oh, bit, by the yeah. way. The, the question then becomes, I'm going to turn to you in two seconds, but the, the, the question then becomes if we moved up just the planning part, so if, if for some you know, reason we actually found extra money, and you know, and, and the world was in a uh, forest was in a bit, a little bit of a better space. H how much would that actually have to cost in order to move the planning up? I'm just recommending um, accelerating all expenditures by, expenditures by one year. So that would. Um, but could we do the planning while we're moving it up? Well, I need the funding for the planning. So right now the expenditures begin in FY26. I'd like to move them up to FY25, which would start July 1st. And the expenditures, but how much would we need just for the planning is my question. That I don't know. Right now you have 297000 programmed in FY26 to begin the planning and design process. And that should be adequate. We'd have to refresh the POR. There are and changes in technologies for uh, refreshing and rebuilding the berms. Uh, that might make them a, a bit more durable, although any any berm being assaulted by high power firearms is going to take a beating. But uh, so planning is certainly in, con uh, in on this on the schedule the executives proposed is certainly pro possible. Uh, and then doing eventual capital improvements is uh, is certainly another matter. Please, thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, OMB would just note that uh, there is concern for capacity um, given the state of the housing market. Uh, a future recordation tax write down uh, could further reduce capacity, um, especially in the early in the six year early in the six year period. Okay. Please, you were patient. Okay. You did a good job. <laughs> um, which one should yeah, I right, take this? I'm going to sell this. Okay. Welcome to the seventh floor. I know. <laughs> Mr. Dice. Oh, by the way. Any, any space in the budget for some other reason? All, <laughs> um, all right. This is an important project, and I, and I agree with that, and I think that we all agree with that. And when we talked about this last year, that was certainly something that we're all in agreement of, that we cannot see ongoing delays, you know, indefinitely. Uh, in, in the fashion that it's been facing those delays since 2007. Um, so when we talked about this last year, as I recall, we decided on a schedule that we felt was doable, obviously not ideal if we had all the money in the world, but that we felt was you know doable for the county's needs and appropriate given the fiscal constraints. Um, and that's what we moved forward and the, the executive accordingly you know approved that, sent that over this year with no further delays. Uh, so from where I sit now, I think it's appropriate for us to stick with that and to move that forward, especially given, you know, the state of the CIP is not good, again, uh, especially in those first three years, as, as, you, as you've noted. We have obviously other projects that are going to be facing delays as well, further delays probably in those first three years. We're going to have to balance some really, really important school and transportation projects, and we're going to be taking some hits there. Uh, so I, from where I sit now, I think it would be appropriate to stick with, stick with what we agreed to last year and what the county executive has, has sent over. Yes. I, I agree that, that we have a lot of things in the CIP that we're looking at how can we make things move um, and knowing that we have restrictions. That being said, um, and I, it's no secret, I've said this repeatedly, extra funding that we have that surplus that that is essentially one-time funding that we're finding ourselves with should be directed to CIP projects right so that we're not further delaying things um, 
the issue is if we bump this up or agree to do that today, which I don't think we can, we th I think what's more prudent is that we wait to see how things shake out in relativity to one another because it, it, the cost of this or moving this forward up a year is not nearly as big as some of the other costs of things, but we have to, it's hard to make that decision without looking at the totality of everything, right? Um, and we haven't made a decision as a body yet as to what we are or are not willing to do with respect to those surplus funds that, again, I have very strong opinions, should not be one-time funds, should not be used for ongoing operational Absolutely. expenses. Mm -hmm. I'll say that till I have no breath left in me. There you go. Um, but we do have other considerations, and so I would respectfully request that we put this on hold. Uh, we would not change where it is currently, but we will reconsider whether or not to expedite it and move it up by one fiscal year, uh, dependent upon the decisions we are making with the um, surplus funding that we have. And, and, and I think that's probably, if, if Ms. Frog, if you can uh, do your magic and come up with some other suggestions on how we can do something else with it, I think that would be something that we would consider and please bring it back. And I, I think that, that the everything begins with planning, so if we could move anything that we can to know what we would might need when it's a, available, it would save us those six months or whatever. Uh, I, I don't know. I think everyone's be a minimum. yeah. yeah. Every, I think everyone's in agreement with that. Yeah. If we could, if we could do that, I think that would be workable. Okay, so I'll work with the executive branch on that. We might possibly bring something back as part of the operating budget discussion. We can bring back this one CIP project as well if there's further updates that we can do before the end of budget. Sounds good. We're good. Sure. We're good. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I just have a couple of projects that are in facility planning, which include the 4th District Police Station and the Alternate Emergency Communication Center. These are not here for a vote. I'm just allowing you – I'm just – uh, providing the opportunity to understand what's going on with these two projects. The 4th District Station, which we've talked about many times before, was built in 1959, and it's the oldest county police facility. It has approximately 11,000 square feet of office space at this time, which does not meet today's staffing and program requirements. For example, the new 3D station is 30,000 square feet, the new 2D station is 32,000 square feet, and 6D will be about 28,000 square feet. Um, at this point, there's also an HVAC replacement project due to start at the 4th District Station. Um, that is in the county's HVAC replacement CIP project, and a purchase of the system was scheduled to be purchased in FY23 and construction and implementation in the spring of FY24. It's my understanding that the station operations may be temporarily relocated while this HVAC work is going on to the Montgomery Planning Headquarters. Um, and it may be helpful if the executive branch could provide an update on what's happening there, as well as it, does this provide an opportunity to relocate 4D Station 2 planning in general, since they they need a new station desperately, is that one option that the executive is considering? So, uh, yes, the plan is to uh, shut down the current 4th District Station for approximately one year. Uh, hopefully less, and we're going to do a $4 million replacement of the mechanical system in that building. While the staff is relocated to uh, one of the floors of the uh, Park and Planning Building in Wheaton, and other, other um, say, field activities, law enforcement activities associated with the typical district station will be um, shared by uh, nearby stations. Uh, and then, uh, the, then the staff can move back in. So it's about a one-year process. Uh, we're ready to start as soon as some of the work in the uh, existing Wheaton building needs to take place in order to make a floor uh, accommodating to the police operations. That work will begin this shortly this spring. this spring, and then, uh, and it won't take long to do that. So we expect hopefully this summer late summer to start this process off so that a year from then uh, the 4th District can be re-inhabited. Re, uh, uh, that, of course, does not um, finalize the ultimate plan to come up with a new modern 4th District uh, station. 
and we are working on a number of options. I hesitate to make those options public at this point pending negotiations, uh, but we are diligently working on an alternate or new location for the 4th District uh, in working with our police colleagues to make sure that it's located where they think it is most suitably located. Uh, as you can appreciate, the availability of land is always changing, and so we're, we're, we're poised to make use of opportunities as soon as they become available. But even that saying that, question might be asked, why are you spending $4 million on a station you're going to... My question. Gonna, yeah. uh, well, see, I figured. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but even if we were to find something right away, a new 4th District uh, station is not going to... The ribbon on that is not going to be cut for five years if we started today. So uh, we can't ask the police to endure more than they have endured. And... Uh, and even moving the administrative staff into the Wheaton office building might be suitable, but it's not the same as a fourth district station. So this is, uh, I've, been, I've encountered this many times in my long career where you spend money you'd rather not spend because it's an interim expense, but it's a necessary expense. Well, and I think it's, there again, it, it's there's certain things you can't afford not to spend on, exactly. and obviously this is this is one of those. If the four million dollars you spend, the four million dollars get the, this building renovated, would at that point, and I don't know where you are in negotiations, but at that point, would the building either be used? We get a new fourth district uh, police station. Would the current fourth district police station either be used? for another county function, or would you sell the building? What, uh, what would happen to that's it? A, that's a great question. Uh, we would look for the best opportunity to exploit. Uh, and uh, right now, we don't know of a candidate county function that would move into that location, but that may change. We are um, out on the in dealing with the public and residents of this county in a myriad of different services and, and, and fashion, so that's a possibility. Uh, but uh, uh, but it will also have some commercial value, too, and an opportunity for um, some sort of real estate deal swap or otherwise. So I'm going to keep my uh, options open. Uh, it's a few years away as yet, and so we'll, we'll see what we can do. And, and I think it should be noted that even though we would be spending this $4 million, it's not like we are losing the $4 million. It will be used in some way for however, uh, for that building. Oh, this is money well spent for the building. Right. It will uh, add significantly to the life of the building. Uh, my team has been in that building perpetually for years and uh, trying to patch things up. If, if anything, it will save operating expenses because we won't have to be in there tweaking the system uh, anymore. For uh, But... The plumbing systems have been upgraded. The mechanical system has been the greatest need of that facility. Uh, and no one's disputing that it's not an optimal police site, but, uh, but we can make it uh, last much better and for longer by doing this work. I have a feeling that the council member from that area would like it. No. To, yeah, no? I, I, Are you good? Yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate the work that's going on. I know we're also working on the satellite station and, and that particular that's project. Correct. Um, you know, so I appreciate the updates that I've been getting from, from you, from Greg, um, and, uh, and know that also Council Member Fanny Gonzalez, uh, who, who shares that district with me as well as you have part of that district, yes, Council Member Mink? Yep. Um, you know, we all know that this is not a good long-term solution, but we know that the new station is coming, and I know Commander Smith's been working with you all on the design, so thank you. Yep. Um, I, I, I agree with that, too. And, and for the, the satellite station, that's something else that we need to continue to keep in mind. Okay, we're good on that one. Um, and the last one is just the alternate emergency communication center, which is here in Rockville. It's the original 911 call center. It was built over 50 years ago. It's a duplicate communication center when needed, and staff regularly relocate here while the PSCC, or the Public Safety Communication Center, undergoes renovations and system upgrades. It does not uh, currently support the best operational configuration due to space limitations and supervision oversight. 
And while funded, the AECC doesn't have updated radio backup equipment that's equivalent to what the PSCC has. This work is still in the planning phase of architecture and space is a concern. And there's also challenges with ongoing networking issues. As the department expands the use of NextGen 911, um, it potentially needs more staff and resources to synthesize the large amount of voice, text, video, and picture data. And the AECC will be even more challenging location to conduct the appropriate emergency communication services. It is in facility planning. This is just for your awareness, but I just wanted to stress the importance of, of helping facilitate its own CIP project. I agree with that. Chief, did you have anything to add? No, I think I think we're on target. I, I appreciate the county executives. All of the Montgomery County Police have, uh, appreciates the county executives and this council's uh, concern over the fourth district. Uh, I've been engaged in some of the discussions on where we're going, um, so I want to say for that it's it's a good thing. And then reference AECC. The uh, we're looking at other opportunities. We're we're trying to be diligent and um, uh, it definitely needs to be addressed. Uh, Director Onley has been uh, terrific at uh, looking at what, what what other things we might be able to do and also going forward, uh, what a new public safety communications uh, primary center would look like. So we're, we're in discussion with uh, uh, DGS and, and trying to trying to be make the best decision as possible with, with again, what we've already heard is limited funds and a lot of work to do. You know, and, and that's always the, the, the theme for any budget is, you know, we, we, we would love to do it, but we have limited funds, so we'll hold this one up for next year. It's always, and we can't, we can't keep holding it up. I mean, if we can't do it this year and whatever, we can't do it, but we can't get it off its timeline. Um, anything else, Ms. Ford? Anything else? Yeah. And I do see Ms. Uh, the uh, the uh, drone program in the room, <laughs> and and uh, I just wanted to congratulate them very publicly on the fine job that you're doing. We we get reports all the time, uh, uh, Captain, and and uh, where and I guess you started two weeks ago. Has it been two weeks for Wheaton? Would you want to come to the table just to? Yeah, thank you. Uh, just for the record, not only drones. <laughs> but, uh, it is under, under yeah. SOD, yep. But, uh, yeah, no, we've been um, live in uh, Wheaton since uh, February 1st was, like, our official okay. kickoff day. Uh, we've seen uh, a lot of successes in Wheaton so far. Um, finalizing, um, hopefully today or tomorrow, some more uh, public announcements to be able to share some of those successes, including some more videos. Uh, to put out for the community to see some of the great work that's been going on up there. But, um, yeah, everything we're seeing, um, you know, average response time, I think we're down to a minute and five seconds. Uh, we're, we're seeing some real quick responses. We're seeing some good information. Um, we've been able to capture and help locate suspects involved in a, a myriad of crimes from a shooting to active assault in front of the Wheaton Rescue Station. We were there quickly. We were able to relay to the firefighters to put the building on lockdown. There was people fighting in front of the, the bays um, to uh, theft suspects and things of that nature. So um, good, good so far. Yeah, we appreciate the support of, of the council, the county executive, and the community. I think it's been a win for everybody so far. Yeah, and I, I think as Commander McBain has pointed out in a couple of recent emails, we've been able to get his officers back in service uh, in a much more timely manner, um, making them more effective. So uh, it's been definitely a game changer for 3D. We expect to see the same thing in 4D and wherever else we end up. I was going to say there's certainly uh, movement that people would like to see it in other other areas as well as you, and and we all should. I mean, this is. This makes sense, so thank you all for doing what you're doing. Yes. Go ahead, please. While you're here, I just want to thank Captain Coquinos for quickly uh, collaborating and working to put together, to, to share with me what it would take for us to be able to um, implement a drone in the up county. 
um, and your thorough knowledge of FAA regulations and uh, requirements to allow us to know not only could we do it, we could do more with it in the up county because we are not subject to as many uh, airspace restrictions. So uh, that potential site has a lot more capability to cover Germantown, Montgomery Village, Gaithersburg. Uh, et cetera, and, um, and be a, a great resource up there. So I know Chair Katz and Council Member Balcom and I did send a letter to the county executive requesting this to be put in the operating budget for FY25, and hopefully we'll be able to collaborate further on that. Okay, very good. Anything else, Ms. Farag, on this one? Thank you all. Thank you very much. And the final uh, area that we have today is the CIP for Corrections and Rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. Ms. Farag also has this packet, and I have a feeling Mr. Stevenson is going to come to the table. That's going to be my thought. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Still morning. It's, uh, and you're going to let Mr. Dice stay there with you? Okay. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Everybody has a resume. <laughs> if the panel could please introduce themselves, welcome. Good morning. Uh, ben you need to touch that. Yep. There you go. Good morning, Ben Stevenson, uh, Director for Department of Correction and Rehabilitation. Good morning, Kate Beckley, Management Services Division Chief. David Dice, Director, Department of General Services. Catherine Bryant Higgins, Office of Management and Budget. Thank you all very much for being with us, Ms. Ms. Farag. Sure. The Correction CIP has three projects um, in the six year expenditure schedule costing about $93 million over the next six years. It's an increase of $24 million over the amended CIP budget of $68, $68 million, and that change is primarily due to the fact construction costs for the Justice Center project have moved into the expenditure schedule. And that's the first project for your consideration today at $92 million. This is completing a whole new structure at the Seven Locks location. This is where the central booking facility is located. There are also some other um, operations that are located there. It's a temporary housing facility. Um, individuals can stay there about 72 hours before they're either released or they're moved up to MCCF, Montgomery County Corrections Facility. Sorry about that, up in Boyd's. Yeah. So um, this provides um, housing for up to 200 short-term inmates it would also be the location of the central, as I said, the central processing unit. Um, there's pretrial services evaluation, medical and mental health assessments, and the county police department's warrant and fugitive section is also there. It also has centralized records and storage of inmates' personal items, and there is some DOCR departmental training. Um, I've outlined the history, which has been varied over the past probably 15 years since I've had the budget. At one time, this include Included the Restoration Center, which is a deflection center that's now called the Diversion Center. These are two separate projects. I just wanted to note that for the public. Um, the Diversion Center is now um, a standalone project under Health and Human Services, and it is no longer part of this project. Um, this project is proposed to be 83,000 square feet. There will currently be space for 88 beds and flexible space to house up to 108 beds. Um, I keep track of the average daily population at this at the current MCDC which this would replace and right now they've got an average daily population hitting around 125 or so so it may be helpful for the executive to explain to the committee um, about bed space what is needed the fact that the recent daily population count has been well over 100 and has reached 130 in the past couple of weeks um, there had been a master facilities confinement study done 10 years ago which had sought to project bed space and other operational space needs through 2035. Um, you know, things have changed. You have a much more complex population that you're dealing with. You have right now, the people who are being housed are being charged with much more serious types of crimes. And so, you know, depending on what the executive says, is there a need to refresh a master facilities confinement study to better look, try to better project since the population needs have changed so much? Stevenson, Very complicated you need question. to touch the button. There you go. Very complicated question uh, and scenario. Uh, I will say we're not in normal yet. 
uh, the courts. Circuit courts are still backed up quite a bit. And so to really have a crystal ball on where this is is, is a little bit difficult. There's a couple drivers to this. Since 2021 to 24, we've had a 94% increase in our overall total average daily population. The drivers on this is more increased bookings. Uh, our length of stay is increased because of the backup going on within circuit court. Uh, we have the Maryland Department of Health where we're holding people beyond a commitment. We have right now currently 33 people that are rolled incompetent awaiting to go to the Maryland Department of Health. And so that stays about average and has been. And so every state or every county is struggling with that as well. Um, also, NCDC's current population right now at the 127 that it is today, we're utilizing that facility. We're flexing that space just situationally where we're holding juveniles, we're holding keep separates, those that have gang affiliations, those to keep it safe. Uh, but we are seeing that trajectory, the count going up, more violent crimes. Juvenile crime, pre-COVID, has gone up 16% is what I've, I've calculated with our numbers. And so with that, I've even most recently asked to look at housing pods in MCDC, in which we've used for storage space to clear them out because we're seeing this trend. Uh, are we at a state of critical mass yet? I don't believe so. And plus, we have many different emergency provisions to be able to increase, increase our count if we have to. Uh, but when you're looking at MCCF, you look at the larger system, that's, a, that's our jail of 1,028 people. You would think it can fit 1,028. Uh, at 800, it's very packed. And it's packed because of different types of keep separates. Particularly the mental health population is so extreme right now that these are cells in which you don't want to house more than one person in. And so with that challenge, it is restricting a lot of the space that we typically think we could fill up and utilize. And so uh, I watch it uh, as much as I can. Uh, you look at 46% of our total populations being supervised in the community. And if you look at the pre-release numbers, they're still staying around 50 to 60 because they don't have enough sentenced people to, to pull into the program and you have to be sentenced. And so. With that, I, I don't know what the new normal, I'm watching it, uh, I'm watching it quite a bit, but um, I don't think, I, I do believe when we look specific to this CIP project, we asked county staff to look at an analysis pre-COVID and post-COVID and give us some recommendations. So we had some, some very strong data to be able to support whether this jail should be at this beds or that beds. And, and as, uh, as Susan mentioned at 108, if the transportation's in line, is this jail uh, uh, the right space? It can be. Uh, of course, we're going to have to increase that transportation. We're going to have to uh, make sure that we're not utilizing it as we are temporarily to hold juveniles and, and other populations to keep safe. And so uh, I don't know if that's very helpful, but a lot of details. Well, it, it, it is helpful. And, and obviously, you are certainly our expert. But for the question about whether or not you, um, whether we should have a new confinement study, Mm -hmm. Should that be considered? What is your thoughts on that? When I reviewed that, and that was 2014, that was a very multi-pronged, multidisciplinary approach to not only just look at the numbers, but to do a larger assessment of all our stakeholders and partners, our state's attorney's office, health and human services. I think for looking at this project, the analysis that we looked at uh, with county staff that looked at our numbers, we really just need to look at our numbers is, is, would be by recommendation uh, versus um, the confinement study was, was very big, it was very robust, it took a long period of time and it was very costly to do that, but it was a good flushing of where we should be looking forward. Do we need that for this particular project? I think uh, an average daily population analysis that was done does speak to the data. Go ahead. Um, for that study, since the um, since the diversion center is now viewed separately, um, was the diversion center factored into the analysis of space allocations in that prior study? In the prior study, it was not. It was not? Because that was 2014. That was 2014. Okay. And have any amendments been done to that? And I've just... I'm. I'm looking at Rachel, so I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna hit pause until she gets to yeah, a microphone. Right. I just wanted to clarify that it was not in the 2014 study um, because that is a new concept, but it was taken into account in the county stat analysis. Gotcha. 
to get to the recommendation of 88 with the ability to flex up to 108 beds. Okay. And then you noted that there are 33 people currently waiting for placement in uh, Maryland Department of Health uh, state-run mental facilities, correct? Um, what's the average hold time or wait time for someone who's determined uh, incompetent to be placed in a state facility? That one's, I, I would have to go back and, and give you that analysis. What I can tell you is when you have uh, a list of people that are ready to go, sometimes we have to reprioritize those lists just based to the acuity of how serious their mental health right. could be. And so if you think about it, it's such a leapfrog scenario that, uh, you know, you're just literally, you know, uh, addressing the most chronically sick at one period of time, and you could keep bumping that list. And so I can see if I can get some analytics okay. to give you that length of stay or how long we're waiting. Thank you. And I know you and I have spoken about this separately, um, but for, for benefit of the, the bigger, broader discussion, um, there are folks who are not determined to be incompetent to participate in their defense, but still have high acuity mental and behavioral health needs, which make them uh, unable to be co-located with another inmate. Is that right? Yes, that okay. is accurate. And has your has your number of those individuals increased where they are, they're not ever going to be going to the state um, mental health facility, but they have to be housed alone? Uh, yes, uh, there's, there's an increase and it's, the mental health sometimes equals the behavior and the behavior is what causes the separation. Right. And the behavior drives us with, we're trying to, you know, mitigate use of force, mitigate any kind of uh, more problematic issues. Mm -hmm. That population has grown. I don't have any hard statistics to give you, but uh, anecdotally, we've been saying for years, the population gets sicker. Mm -hmm. At this point in time, not only are we seeing that they're sicker, is just we are putting out fires of the most extreme to levels that we haven't pre-COVID and, and, and literally from my career, I've not seen it to this level. So. And then um, I know you noted that there's been an increase in juveniles who must be kept separate, yes. right, from, from adult inmates. Um, and you mentioned a 16% increase, and, mm -hmm. and that's a 16% increase in the number of juveniles being held for crimes, correct? Yes, and that is 16% uh, as I calculated is those that are under the age of 21. Okay, so uh, that includes our what we call young adult. Yes, young centers. adults. Okay. And that would be those that are mandated to still receive some sort of education as well. Mm -hmm. And so that's 161, I believe, this morning's report. And I believe eight are under the years of 18. Okay. Thank you. Um, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I mean, given that my understanding is that kind of the a big part of the initial reason for this large-scale project was um, diversion programs, it definitely seems important to take the new diversion center into account when we think about what the needs are exactly. And then a lot of the, um, you know, the issues with beds and such that we're having are issues that, you know, we would like to see solved through improved uh, uh, processes on the operating side. Uh, so uh, seconding what uh, Councilmember Lukey pointed out, I think we do need some more information. Okay. Ms. Frog, are you good with that? Um, the second project is the Montgomery County Correctional Facility and Community Corrections Wi-Fi project um, for $936,000. This is providing for the design and implementation of wireless internet at MCCF and Community Corrections, Neville Street. Uh, the project also supports installation of wireless internet upgrades for Montgomery County Detention Center at Seven Locks and it'll provide MCCF network switches and install Wi-Fi throughout the MCCF facility, including the common areas of housing pods, the medical suite, and the administrative areas. Wi-Fi will also be installed throughout the community corrections facility. Implementing Wi-Fi at MCCF and community corrections will enhance the implementation of their new electronic health records system. It helps improve work productivity and it provides advanced learning technology for the staff and inmate population. Um, MCCF housing and administrative areas have been completed and community corrections upgrades are programmed for FY25. Uh, there is no cost change to this project. The project is expected to be completed um, in this fiscal year, upcoming fiscal year, not recommending any changes. And I'm certainly good with that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the last one is the Montgomery County Correctional Facility refresh for $4 million. 
Uh, this facility was built in 2003, which seems new to me, but it has had some limited capital improvements despite significant wear and tear over the past couple of decades. This project provides for the planning of a refresh project to include medical unit modifications, remediation of clogged vents in inmate cells. The medical unit modifications include moving a nurse and correctional officer station to improve sight lines, increase female inmate capacity, increase inmate holding cell space and other adjustments needed to accommodate implementation of the state's mandated medication assistment assistant treatment program. It also provides for painting throughout the facility and carpet replacement in the administrative areas. Total project costs remain the same. Council staff recommends approval of all the projects as submitted by the executive. No, I'm, I'm good with yeah. that. Okay. Anything else, Ms. Frog? No. We're good. Thank you all very, very much for what you do. We sincerely appreciate it. And, uh, thank you for keeping people safe inside and outside the facility. Thank you. We are adjourned.